Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Well, today's topic is a topic we all think about while doing our best not to think about it. The topic is death. And how we think about death changes depending on whether we're thinking about dying ourselves or about losing the people we love. But whichever side of the coin we take here, death is really an ever-present reality for us. And it is so whether we're thinking about it or not. It's always announcing itself in the background, on the news, in the stories we hear about the lives of others, in our concerns about our own health, in the attention we pay when crossing the street. If you observe yourself, Closely, you'll see that you spend a fair amount of energy each day trying not to die. And has long been noted by philosophers and contemplatives and poets, death makes a mockery of almost everything else we spend our lives doing. Just take a moment to reflect on how you've spent your day so far, the kinds of things that captured your attention. The things that you've been genuinely worried about. Think of the last argument you had with your spouse. Think of the last hour you spent on social media. Over the last few days, I've been spending an inordinate amount of time trying to find a new font for my podcast. This has literally absorbed hours of my time. So if you had stopped me at any point in the last 48 hours and asked me what I'm up to, what really concerns me, what deep problem I'm attempting to solve, the solution to which seems most likely to bring order to the chaos in my corner of the universe? The honest answer would have been, I'm looking for a font. Now, I'm not saying that everything we do has to be profound in every moment. I mean, sometimes you just have to find a font. But contemplating the brevity of life brings some perspective to how we use our attention. It's not so much what we pay attention to, it's the quality of attention. It's how we feel while doing it. If you need to spend the next hour looking for a font, you might as well enjoy it. Because the truth is, none of us know how much time we have in this life. And taking that fact to heart brings a kind of moral and emotional clarity and energy to the present or at least it can, and it can bring a resolve to not suffer over stupid things. I mean, take something like road rage. This is probably the quintessential example of misspent energy. You're behind the wheel of your car, and somebody does something erratic, or they're probably just driving more slowly than you want, and you find yourself getting angry. Now, I would submit to you that that kind of thing is impossible if you're being mindful of the shortness of life. If you're aware that you're going to die and that the other person is going to die and that you're both going to lose everyone you love and you don't know when, you've got this moment of life, this beautiful moment, this moment where your consciousness is bright, where it's not dimmed by morphine in the hospital, on your last day among the living. And the sun is out, or it's raining. Both are beautiful. And your spouse is alive. And your children are alive. And you're driving. And you're not in some failed state where civilians are being rounded up and murdered by the thousands. You're just running an errand. And that person in front of you, who you will never meet, whose hopes and sorrows you know nothing about, but which if you could know them, you would recognize are impressively similar to your own, is just driving slow. This is your life, the only one you've got, and you will never get this moment back again. And you don't know how many more moments you have. No matter how many times you do something, 
There will come a day when you do it for the last time. You've had a thousand chances to tell the people closest to you that you love them in a way that they feel it and in a way that you feel it. And you've missed most of them. And you don't know how many more you're going to get. You've got this next interaction with another human being to make the world a marginally better place. You've got this one opportunity to fall in love with existence. So why not relax and enjoy your life? Really relax. Even in the midst of struggle. Even while doing hard work. Even under uncertainty. You are in a game right now. And you can't see the clock. So you don't know how much time you have left. And yet you're free to make the game as interesting as possible. You can even change the rules. You can discover new games that no one has thought of yet. You can make games that used to be impossible suddenly possible and get others to play them with you. You can literally build a rocket to go to Mars so that you can start a colony there. I actually know people who will spend some part of today doing that. But whatever you do, however seemingly ordinary, you can feel the preciousness of life. And an awareness of death is the doorway into that way of being in the world. And there are very few people who are more aware of death and the lessons it has to teach us than my guest today. Today I'm speaking to Frank Ostaseski. Frank is a Buddhist teacher and a leading voice in end-of-life care. In 1987, he co-founded the Zen Hospice Project, which was the first Buddhist hospice in America. And in 2004, he created the Metta Institute to train healthcare workers in compassionate and mindful end-of-life care. And Frank has been widely featured in the media, on Bill Moyer's television series, On Our Own Terms, in the PBS series, With Our Eyes Open, on The Oprah Winfrey Show, and in many print publications. He's been honored by the Dalai Lama for his work in this area. And he's the author of a new book, The Five Invitations, Discovering What Death Can Teach Us About Living Fully. If you want more information about Frank and his work, you can find the relevant links on my blog. And I'm sure you'll hear in the next hour of conversation that Frank's is the voice of a man who has taken the time to reflect on the brevity of life. And a wonderful voice it is. So now I bring you Frank Ostaseski. I am here with Frank Ostaseski. Frank, thanks for coming on the podcast. Sam, nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. So we, we know many people in common. We were introduced by our mutual friend, Joseph Goldstein, who was, who was a very old friend of mine and one of my first meditation teachers. Was he a teacher for you as well? He was, uh, as was Jack and Sharon in the early days and many of the other Asian teachers who came through town as well. So I had an introduction to that world of Theravadan, Vipassana practice, but also in Zen practice when I came to uh, start the Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco, which was the first, first Buddhist hospice in America, actually. Nice. Well, I, I would definitely want to, to focus our conversation on death and dying, which, you, which is really your area of expertise. It's, it's amazing that someone can be an expert in that, but you, <laughs> you are certainly one of them. Just before we begin, tell people what uh, hospice care is. So you could think of hospice care as um, um, something on the continuum of health care that is usually accessed when people are in the final six months to a year of their life. Uh, it's generally oriented toward comfort care, managing symptoms, uh, controlling people's pain, helping people uh, who are, have chosen not to necessarily pursue more curative therapies. Hospice care might happen in people's home or it might happen in a facility. And of course, now um, we're seeing a kind of blending of hospice care and what is called palliative care or comfort care that's even happening in acute care facilities. Mm. So what was different about Zen Hospice, we did all the normal things that any other hospice would do, but we tried to add to that mix the 
component of mindfulness. We wondered what would it be like, you know, to bring together people who are cultivating what we might call a listening mind or a listening heart through meditation practice and people who needed to be heard at least once in their life, folks who were dying. And in our case, those folks were people who lived on the streets of San Francisco, at least initially. Mm -hmm. Now, now, was this during the AIDS epidemic? No, the AIDS epidemic was, you know, started around 1980 or so in San Francisco, a little bit earlier. And this was in about the mid 80s. Right. So um, we were caring for both people with AIDS and also people with uh, cancer. Uh, mostly we were tending to people that the system, um, that kind of fell through the gaps in the system. How did you first get into this? And what, and what was your first encounter with death? At what point in your life did you begin to have a more than average interest in <laughs> contemplating death and, and, and using it as a lens through which to view your life and, and view how you could actually be of help to other people? Yeah, good, great question. Well, I mean, death and I got, you know, introduced early on. My mom died when I was about 16 and my dad a few years later. So death came into my life quite early. Um, Buddhist practice with its emphasis on impermanence was another kind of path that helped me come toward this work. Um, for a while, I worked in refugee camps in southern Mexico and Central America, where I saw a lot of horrible dying, actually, um, and was quite helpless to do anything about that at times. And then when I came back to San Francisco, the AIDS epidemic had just, you know, just begun. We didn't even know what it was. Um, Stephen Levine, who was a uh, teacher and dear friend, um, was a big influence, uh, both on my own personal life, but also on the creation of the Zen Hospice Project. Much of what he did and taught influenced uh, how we set up the hospice and, and how we cared for people. So, yeah, I think I was really, I was introduced to death really early on. And it wasn't so much that, um, it wasn't just about the study of death. It was about how can we really be of service to people in their most vulnerable moments? And what happens in that exchange, you know? And these days, of course, it's not just about how do we prepare for our dying. It's more about what can we learn from the wisdom of death that can help us live a full, happy, meaningful, rich life? I mean, to imagine, Sam, at the time of our dying, that we will have the physical strength, the emotional stability, the mental clarity to do the work of a lifetime is a kind of ridiculous gamble. <laughs> and so I don't suggest that we wait until that time. I suggest that we you know, reflect on these issues and reflect on this you know, fact of our life now. And not so much so that we have a good death. I'm not even sure what that is anymore. But really so that, you know, we can really get how absolutely precarious this life is. And when we understand something about that, we come into contact with that directly in our bones. I think we also come into contact with just how precious this life is. And then we don't want to waste a moment, you know. And then we want to jump in with both feet. We want to tell the people we love that we love them. So I think that this is really the great great learning that's come to me from being with folks who are dying, which is that, you know, it's easy to take life for granted. And when we do, it's, it's, it's easy for us to get caught up in our neurotic concerns. And, and I think that's the beautiful thing. About, that's a beautiful legacy that I have from people who are dying is it really showed me what matters most, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so everything you just said can be valued in, a, in an entirely secular and atheistic context. I mean, most people, given the nature of my audience, who are hearing this conversation will be fairly sure that when they die, that will be the end of conscious existence. And, and they will be, certainly many of them, reluctant to think about the significance of death in any form of otherworldly context. You know, the idea that, there's the, that you, one would want to have a good death or be prepared to meet one's death for reasons that extend beyond the moment of death, because they, they imagine there's, there's nothing beyond the moment of death. And I must confess, I'm fairly agnostic on that point. I think that obviously there are good reasons to believe that when you're dead, you're dead. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about what might happen after death, but I spend a lot of time thinking about death and about the shadow it casts back on the rest of life and the way in which that shadow can clarify life and cause us to, to prioritize things that we will wish we had prioritized when our lives come to an end. 
and whether that end comes by surprise or or in a way that's that's more orderly. I'm happy to talk about anything you may or may not believe about the global significance of of death, but to focus for a moment on just what can be learned in the context of this life that doesn't presuppose belief in anything beyond it. What are the the things that people are most confused about, most surprised by? What 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 is waiting there to be discovered by someone who who really hasn't thought much about death and has you know avoided thinking about it, frankly, and what is the value of of learning those lessons sooner rather than later? Yeah, great question. You know, I mean, I don't know what happens after we die, Sam. I don't know. Um, we'll find out, right? But I, I think that without a reminder of death, we tend to take our life for granted and we become lost in these endless pursuits of self-gratification, you know. But, you know, as I was mentioning, when we keep it close at hand, you know, at our fingertips, I think it reminds us not to hold on so tightly. And I think we take ourselves and our ideas a little less seriously. And I, I think we let go a little more easily. And, and what I find is that when there's a reflection on death, we come to understand that we're all in the boat together. <laughs> and I think this helps us to be kinder and gentler to one another, actually. You know, the habits of our life, they have a powerful momentum, right? They propel us toward, you know, right unto the moment of death. And so the obvious question arises, what habits do I want to create? Not whether or not they'll give me a better afterlife, but here in this life, you know, my thoughts are not harmless. My thoughts take shape as actions. And, you know, you know the old story, they develop into habits and harden into character. So an unconscious relationship with my thoughts leads me to reactivity. And, um, and I want to live a life that's more responsible and more, I want to say clean. That's the best way I could, I would describe it. Yeah. Living with an awareness of death is obviously a, an ancient spiritual practice. I mean, this an admonition that one should do this dates back as, as far as Socrates and the Buddha and several books in, in the, the Old Testament, like Ecclesiastes. And, and I think all three of those are, are more or less contemporaneous with one another. But it, go, it must go back further than that. And so it's, it's, it's no accident that monks and, and renunciates and contemplatives do this very deliberately. They focus on death and they live their lives, they seek to live their lives as though they could end at any moment. And they're, and they're trying to prioritize those things that will be the things that make sense in one's last hour of life. Again, this is often framed by a kind of otherworldly belief, but certainly not always. And I remember Stephen Levine, who you just mentioned, at one point decided to live a year consciously doing this, consciously living a year as he would want to live a year if it were going to be his last year. And this, this struck me as an amazing thing to do. But of course, he had more than one more year to live. In fact, I think he had at least 20 at that point. He died a couple of years ago. I mean, there's a bit of a paradox here because there are many things, many good things in life, not merely superficial things that we can only engage, that we can only seek with real energy based on the assumption that we will live a fairly long time. And I mean, this something like the decision to have a child or to spend five or more years on, on your next project. And in most cases, it is a safe assumption that we have at least an average span of time in which to do these things. How do you square that with this, this imperative that we not take life for granted and that we use the clarifying wisdom of impermanence in each moment insofar as we're able? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that, one of the ways we can shift the conversation, even the one that you and I are having, is that it isn't all about preparing for my death. It isn't all about this moment at which I stop breathing, but more about how do I live my life on an ongoing basis? You know, um, I had a heart attack a few years ago, and one of the things I did um, after that heart attack is I did some reading about other people who had had heart attacks. And one of the people I met up on was Maslow. You know, Maslow suffered a near fatal heart attack at one point in his life. And, and afterwards, he wrote this beautiful thing. He said, the confrontation with death and the reprieve from it, the reprieve from it makes everything look so precious, so sacred, so beautiful that I feel more strongly than ever 
the impulse to love it, to embrace it, and to let myself be overwhelmed by it. He said, my river has never looked so beautiful. Death and its ever-present possibility makes love, passionate love, more possible. Now that's beautiful, huh? It's not just about um, preparing for this final moment, really, but really looking and seeing how does it, what happens if these, if we stop separating life and death, if we stop pulling them apart, you know, if we saw them as one thing. So for me, um, one of the things that that does is help me really see the beauty of life. I mean, you know, think about the cherry blossoms that cover the hillsides of Japan every spring, right? Or this place where I teach in northern Idaho, where there are these blue flax flowers that last for a single day. How come they're so much more beautiful than plastic flowers? You know, I mean, isn't it their brevity? Isn't it the fact that they will end that is part of their beauty? So I think that's true with our human lives as well. It's not like, get ready, death is coming, you know, don't screw it up. It's more like, oh, how do I appreciate this? So for me, being with dying, is a lot, you know, has built in, built up in me a tremendous sense of gratitude and appreciation for the fact that I'm alive. And so it isn't just about, you know, trying to cram for a test, right. you know, this final test where we think we're going to pass fail. I don't know what happens after we die. I don't know. We'll find out how it is. But what I do know, and this is interesting, Sam, is that everybody's got a story about what happens after they die. And my experience is that that story shapes the way in which they die, and in some ways, even the way in which they live their life. And we could talk about that. And that's, you know, I, I remember being with the president of the California Atheist Association who came to Zen Hospice to die. I was really proud that he came there, that he didn't feel anyone was going to push any dogma on him, that we weren't going to try and talk him into some kind of belief system, and that it could go the way he needed it to go. It's not my job to convince him of something otherwise, you know? It's my job to find out what's his vision? You know, how does he need to go through this? Actually, I want to ask you about that because it's, it has struck me more and more that secularists and atheists are really lacking resources to guide them both when they get sick and, and need to think about their own deaths or, or confront the deaths of those close to them. It just is a fact that there isn't a strong, familiar secular tradition around how to perform a funeral, right? I mean, who do you call when, right. when right. You know, someone close to you dies? No matter how atheistic you are, many people are left calling their rabbi or their priest or, and just asking them to dumb it down because the only people who know how to perform funerals and the only, the only language around these moments in life is just explicitly framed by by religion. And it, it needn't be. I mean, you know, I, I did hundreds of memorials for people through the AIDS epidemic, you know, and most of them had no, you know, as you say, some of them had an early religious training. And we can talk about how that influences the way in which we die, by the way. But, you know, so we had to create things. We had to draw, you know, ritual, how, you know how it is with ritual. Ritual has this way of bringing forward the truth that's already there in the room, in a way. True ritual, different than ceremony evokes something fundamental in us, we could say. It might draw on an ancient wisdom or some, you know, ancient practice, but really it's about how do we evoke the truth that's right here, right now? That's often what, what characterized a lot of the memorial services that I did. But one of the things that I saw with people, whether they were, had religious training or not, one of the things that really mattered most of them was relationship. What's their relationship? with themselves, with the people that they cared about in their lives, you know, with um, reality, however we might define that. And so one of the tickets in, if you will, or one of the paths in for people who even had sworn off religion years ago was some sense of interdependence, we might call it, or connection is a better way to say it. That was their, that was their religion. I, mean, I could share hundreds of stories with you about people who had no religious training at all, but loved their time in nature. And so we would work with that, you know, we'd work with that experience as a way of helping them ease into the mystery of what happens in dying. I mean, look, dying is, we know at least this much. We know that dying is much more than a medical event, you know? And so the profundity of what occurs in the dying process 
is too big to fit into any model, whether that's a medical model or a religious model. It's too big. It shakes us loose of all of our, you know, it, all the ways we've defined ourselves, all the identities we've carried over all these years. They're either stripped away by illness or they're gracefully given up, but they all go. And then who are we? You know? And I think these are questions that people wrestle with in a time at the, as they come closer to the end of their lives. Of course, if they have some religious or spiritual training, it influences that, that exploration. But, you know, it doesn't, um, it, it comes up for people anyway. Even those people who think dying is a dial tone, you know, <laughs> that, you know, where there's nothing that happens. Even them, their, the reflection on their relationships and how they've conducted those relationships is really important. I mean, this really big question at the end of people's lives is usually something not like, you know, is there life after death? But it's something more like, am I loved? And did I love? I'm always struck by the, the asymmetry between dying and having others die. I mean, obviously, I haven't died, so I, I don't know firsthand what that's like. But, you know, having lost people close to me and, and seeing other people go through this experience, it is different being the one dying. and. Obviously, the, the person who dies loses everyone, but he or she also loses the experience of having to live with, the, with that experience of loss. And he or she doesn't have to live in a world where, where everyone is just carrying on as before and where a person's grief becomes a kind of embarrassment or, or something that, that other people have to, to figure out what to do with or, or navigate around in some way. Are there two sides of this? I mean, is, is the death experience and the bereavement experience importantly different in any way? Yes. I think we could make some uh, distinctions there that would be important. But, I mean, remember, that, as you say, the person who's dying loses everything. And so he or she going through this process is usually going through some kind of bereavement. They're going through some anticipation anyway of loss. And so they're, it's not uncommon in the dying process for people to experience many of the same things that their loved ones might experience after their death. You know, there is the shock and denial, which is that, you know, part of that initial experience of grief, right? And it's there in the dying process as well. This feeling of you've been punched in the belly when someone you love dies. You've lost your ability to breathe, actually. And you're disoriented and confused and you don't know which way to go. And there's all that. And then there's this period, uh, you know, I call that loss, right? That's the experience of loss. And then there's this long period that goes on for months, sometimes years of losing. And it's not just a single event when someone we love dies. When your wife dies and, and, and you climb into bed at night and the sheets are cold, you lose her again, you know? Or if she was the one who did the banking and you go to the, the bank, you know, to do some business, you lose her again. And so there's this long period of losing that goes on for a long, long time, you know. I remember working with a CEO of a big company, you know, this was an extremely competent guy, you know, who, you know, had a company of a thousand people. But at night he was eating tuna fish out of a can at his house after his wife died. It wasn't that he didn't know how to cook or he couldn't go out to a restaurant. It's like he couldn't manage that. Every time he started to do something, I cook a meal. The loss, the feeling of loss of his wife was overwhelming to him. And it stopped him, so he just opened a can of tuna fish. And then there's this third, we could call it phase, but I'm suspicious of models so much, but where we have this feeling that there's a loosening, we could call it. So there's loss, there's losing, and then there's loosening. Loosening is when the, the stranglehold of grief relaxes a little bit, where our life isn't so defined by that loss anymore. And we feel like mm, we can reinvest in a life. You know, we've been in a kind of altered state for a period of time. And then we start reinvesting in life. Like there was this woman I worked with and her husband died. They'd been married for a long time, maybe 40 or 50 years. And um, she said that she would go home at night, every night, and set a place for him at the table. And every night she would talk to him. And she would hear him answer in a way in his own voice, so to speak, inside her head. She said after about six months, she stopped making the place for him at the table, but she continued to ask his advice on everything in life because she had done that while he was alive. She said after about a year, I said, how is it now? She said, oh, it's pretty good now. She said, I take him with me everywhere I go, but now I decide where we go on vacation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so there was just this feeling of loosening, like, oh, you know, that, that stranglehold isn't there so much. 
I think people go in the, particularly those who are dying of long-term illness, go through a similar process actually, as they approach their death. They have this shock and then there's this long period of identity being lost and roles changing, et cetera. And then there's this kind of loosening that often happens for people in the short time before they die. It might be in the weeks before they die. It might be in the final moments before they die where they start to experience something else. And it's not that, we might say that's too late. And, and, and I might agree. But here's the thing, Sam. If it's possible then, it's possible now. If it's possible to have that kind of openness and expansion and you know, truthfulness, well, we can do that now. You know? And for me, again, that's the real wisdom of being with dying is it shows us how to live our lives. Yeah. Well, I, I want to pick up on something you just said there about it seemed to distinguish dying from a long-term illness and, and dying in other ways. And, and I can imagine that running a hospice would give you a uniquely good view of some of the ways people die, but almost by definition, these would be the most orderly ways. And maybe even, this is an act of imagination on my part, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm imagining that this is really selecting for people who obviously know that they're dying and their loved ones know that they're dying. and I would imagine this is a circumstance where, where grief is, is most reconciled, you know, where people are, are just, they're not blindsided by the surprise that, you know, death has suddenly entered their lives, as would be the case if, you know, someone dies in a natural disaster or some routine medical procedure that goes wrong where, where death wasn't even on the menu, seemingly, and then all of a sudden some young person has died. I, mean, I remember I knew a couple where, the they were in their early 30s and the wife had what seemed to be bronchitis in fact i think it was bronchitis and she went to the er because she was she had spiked a fever and and you know someone told her to go to the er and she never made it out of the er i mean it just for whatever reason she died of of bronchitis that became something worse or or just killed her and everyone in their immediate circle was just obliterated by this because you know death had not been on anyone's mind and it just this just seemed like an impossible failure of medicine to keep death away is there an important difference here in in how people die with respect to the grief process around them or is or is death still death no of course there's more complexity to it i mean first of all our our response of grief our response to loss is determined by a lot of things. The nature of our relationship with the person who's died, the nature of the illness, how it happened, all of those things are factors that influence or impact the way in which we grieve. Um, and yes, it's true that most of the people I work with had advanced illness and they usually had some predictable course, if you will, to their illness. But I think it would be foolish to imagine that people are completely open to that. You know, a lot of people go to their death even knowing they have a life-threatening illness or a terminal illness, you know, sort of dragging their heels, you know, <laughs> leaving skid marks. So I don't think that it's true that people necessarily open to their dying. We have this term in America, which I like a lot, which is later, later. It might happen later, you know, and that gives us a comfortable distance, a kind of buffer between us and death that um, I always want to sort of poke holes in a little bit and quite make it, how it causes us to question that. I work with a woman who's husband was a policeman. He'd lived on the, you know, worked on the police force, dangerous situations, day in and day out. And he finally retired. And they were like looking forward to their golden years. He went to the hospital, kind of like what you were describing, got diagnosed, and three weeks later, he was dead. Now, you know, they'd lived with death in a way, all, or the potential of death all along because of the nature of his work. This woman was, you know, grieving heavily, of course, it was interesting. One of the things, I asked her what really helped. And she said, oh, I had this friend of mine who would call me up every Monday night. And she'd say, I want to invite you to dinner. And I know you probably won't come, but it's okay. I'll call you again next Monday. And we'll see how it goes, you know. And that one small little thing, you know, that not leaving her alone in her grief was incredibly helpful to her. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's another component here that people, people often don't know how to be around other people's bereavement. Absolutely. That creates a, a kind of awkwardness, and there's, like a, there's a layer of awkwardness and embarrassment and weirdness that, that begins to form between people who have lost someone and 
the other people in their lives who really would just want to console them but don't necessarily know how to do it based on their own discomfort with with death or just discomfort with someone's grief or just just the the unfamiliarity of the situation do you have advice for people who not not the people who have lost someone but who are around someone who has who has lost someone close to them absolutely i mean I just came back from teaching in Italy. And, you know, in the old days, we used to have wear a black armband or even black clothing when someone in our life died. And it was kind of a message that said, you know, I'm in an altered state. You know, don't expect me to behave normally, you know? So particularly in those first weeks when someone, after someone dies, you know, they need practical help. They need somebody to give them food and do their laundry and help them with the insurance forms. And then they need consistent contact, real contact, not cliches, not rhetoric. What happens for us is, you know, you go to a party and your mother's died and nobody mentions it because we don't want to upset you. And what we do, of course, is leave people isolated in their loss and their experience of grief by not engaging them. So just honesty, you know, real conversation that says something like, you know, I heard your mother died. I can't imagine how that is for you, but I'd like to hear. Be willing to listen. Listening is a beautiful act of love. You know, it's a really great way to, it's the shortest distance between two people, I think. And so just be real with people. Don't be afraid of their strong emotions or their lack of strong emotions. We've got a lot of notions in this country about managing people's grief and having them get over their grief. And we've got timetables for it. We've got protocols and procedures. You know, it's curious to me, we never talk about getting over our joy or managing our joy. I mean, grief is just part of the human condition, right? It flows through all our lives. It's, it's, it's our common ground with one another. And we all have some experience of loss. We all have some experience of grief. I mean, sometimes it's about what we've had and lost, like a relationship. But sometimes it's about what we never got to have. That's another face of our grief. So I, I had two people very close to me die early in my life. I, had a, I lost a best friend at 13, and then my father died when I was 17. And I remember my, the, the first real breakup I had where, where my girlfriend broke up with me in college, that had a very similar character. I mean, the, the, my experience of loss there had a very similar character, and it, was, it, would, it might have even been, to some degree, drawing some energy from kind of the unresolved grief of having lost my father like you know, a year or so before. Our response to death is not totally unlike our response to any sort of important loss, certainly the, the loss of a relationship. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, one of my mentors in this work was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. You know, I studied with her. She sort of took me under her wing. And she used to talk about, you know, it, it sort of, and that every loss triggers the pool of grief that's there, you know, the ordinary, everyday grief of our lives that, that we all live with, you know, and the wants that aren't met, uh, you know, dreams that are lost. Our grief isn't just about death. It's about lost dreams. And as you say, you know, relationships that come and go. You know, when we fight against the truth of things coming and going, we suffer. Right? I mean, everything's coming and going all the time. That's not only uh, a central teaching in Buddhist practice, but it's a fact of life. You know, we don't have to be Buddhist to see that. Everything's coming and going all the time. Now, what's curious to me is that we all agree that seasons come and go, that, you know, my blonde hair is long gone. But we still think of ourselves as a solid thing moving through a changing world. We don't regard ourselves as constant change. And this is the shock that, you know, comes to us when dying shows up or we get a terminal diagnosis. We all of a sudden realize, like viscerally, in our bones, oh my God, I thought I was exempt from this. That is one of the strangest things, that this is the one thing that is guaranteed, you know, Barring some technical breakthrough that solves the problem of death as though it were some kind of engineering problem, and this is obviously something that many technophiles hold out some hope for, but barring that, this is the only thing, really, that, that is absolutely guaranteed to happen, and yet the experience of having it happen to others in one's life and the experience, as you say, of finding out that it'll happen to you is just uniformly one of, of shock. and we really are not well suited to, to, to understand our circumstance if the one guaranteed thing is almost universally met with surprise. 
I mean, if we're, if we're all in collusion around that, it's pretty difficult to face that. I mean, I was giving a talk not long ago in, with some Silicon Valley folks, and I said, you know, death is inevitable. And one guy raised his hand. He said, I'm not so sure about that. He said, you know, we're working on that. I said, okay. I said, let's take death out of the, out of the conversation for a moment. Let's just talk about endings. How do you meet endings? You know, you want to know something about what death has to teach? Look at endings. You know, the end of an exhale, the end of a day, the end of a meal, the end of this sentence. How do you meet endings? Do you go unconscious around them? Do you, you know, leave emotionally or mentally before something's over? You know, do you get teary-eyed about endings or anxious about them? How do you meet endings? We want to prepare for death or at least learn something about what death has to teach. I think studying endings, endings rather, the way we meet endings is a really great way to do it. I mean, how do you leave a party? You know, do you just ghost out or do you, you know, consciously go around and say goodbye to people? Uh, I think that's, again, I'm looking for the ordinary everyday ways to bring death more into our life, not as some frightening character, but really just getting it that these two are always tied up in each other. In Japanese, there's a really great saying or phrase, it's shoji, and it means life death. And it's, you know, the same thing, with just this little hyphen between life and death, you know, this thin line that connects the two, really. We can't really pull them apart, but we try to. We try to, and we persuade ourselves that we do, and, and then we live in that, you know, that false reality. How did your experience of having a heart attack affect your work or your, your perception of this problem? Oh, boy. Well, you know, I mean, I used to think I knew a lot about dying. You know, I've been with a lot of people who died. I thought I knew something about it. <laughs> and then I realized that, you know, the, the um, view from the other side of the sheets is really different, you know? In other words, when you're the person that's uh, coming close to death. You know, I, um, it was humbling, actually, really humbling. Was it a major heart attack? Did it seem like you were going to die? Or Yeah, tri triple bypass surgery. Big deal. I was teaching a retreat for docs and nurses on compassion. And actually, I was in the middle. Uh, I, had, I started to feel heart pain. I denied it, as most people do with heart pain. Then it came again. I was leading a meditation on sensing the body, actually, as it happened. And it was just more sensation in the body, right? It was a bypass in my case. Then I was, in a, I was actually in a video conference with Ram Dass. And uh, Ram Dass is talking. And I find myself getting emotionally irritable. And I was saying under my breath, oh, Ram Dass, come on, be quiet. You know, you're talking too much. <laughs> and he, I love him. He's a dear friend, you know. And um, I realized it reminded me of when my wife was giving birth to our first child, that um, she got emotionally irritable with me. And that's what really cued me into the fact that something was wrong. So they took me to the hospital and I had a heart attack in the emergency room. So I was fortunate, really fortunate. But the, the, the process of going through a surgery, big 12-hour surgery and such, you know, it's, it's a massive trauma to the body to go through this kind of surgery. And so it took a long time for me to heal. It took several months also because, in my case, they cut a phrenic nerve, which is, controls the diaphragm, makes your lung inflate. So my left lung didn't inflate for several months. So I felt tremendously weak at home. I felt dependent after my heart attack. I was depressed. I was, uh, I just felt helpless. But gradually, what I noticed as I paid attention to these things and I allowed these states is that that helplessness, that dependency, it became something more like vulnerability. It became something more like porousness or transparency even. And I began to experience much of what the same things that the patients that I'd worked with had experienced. You know, I, um, I, I was very fortunate. I had great people around me who took care of me. I got really wonderful, supportive letters from people all over the place. And that love that came to me was really helpful. And it was beautiful that people loved me. And it was nice to feel that reassurance. But what it really did was introduce me to it more intimately, the love of my own being for me. I want to just the best way I could say it. And as, I, as that happened, as that established itself more, I felt this deep, deep trust, an incredible trust, not in something other than me, but in reality itself. And with this trust arose a kind of rest 
Sam, a deep, deep rest, like body at rest, heart at rest, consciousness at rest, really. And so, you know, you know this experience, you know what that's like, you know, you've written about it. There's this great sense of being at peace with the way things are, not fighting against life. And then there's this kind of absence of struggle, you know, for a period of time. And this went on for, in my case, for several months where there was not so much a sense of Frank there. Uh, not my ordinary, you know, personality wasn't so much in charge, if you will. It came back, you know, it reasserted itself. You know, it came back one day and said, no, don't worry, here I am. I'm back, I'm in charge. But once that experience, once you've had those experiences and they're not just some spiritual highlight, but actually deeply integrated, you can't fool yourself anymore that you're in charge. <laughs> I, had these, I had these beautiful dreams uh, for about four or five months. Every night, people I had taken care of came to me in my dreams. It wasn't visitations, but you know, I, I, uh, sometimes they would come and say thank you, or sometimes they'd give me a piece of advice, or sometimes they'd just come and keep company with me. And I felt myself, you know, deeply connected to all these people whose lives, uh, you know, we'd intermingled with each other. We touched each other's lives in very intimate ways. And they were there. As that was there for me as a kind of support as I went through this process. But it was humbling, absolutely humbling. I, I, I was really... Um, taken back by the experience, you know. How long was the full recovery process? It took about, in my case, because of my problems with my lung, it took about six months. And then I had another, two of the grafts that they had put in had failed. And so I had to go back into the hospital and for a different procedure. And so it took many, it took several more months after that. So the whole process took roughly about a year for me to sort of heal. And, you know, in the early stages of that, I was quite disabled. You know, I couldn't, do things like go to the toilet by myself or shower by myself. And so fortunately, I had really good friends. I had a hospice nurse who was, you know, had been my assistant. She came, literally moved in and helped take care of me. And a guy who I'd worked with who had been through leukemia, a big, strong guy, a friend um, who I'd helped through his healing, he came in and took care of me. It was great because he was also big. He could pick me up and carry me places. And that was really great. Let me, let me share a story with you, if I can, about in the hospital. And because this, is, this goes to this whole business about mindfulness. I come out of surgery, and I'm in the cardiac care unit, and I've got tubes coming into every possible orifice, including I'm intubated, which means a machine is breathing for me. And I'm in this kind of anesthesia fog, and my son, who's an adult at that point, about 29, and my best friend, the meditation teacher, are there with me. And into the room comes this respiratory therapist who says, let's pull out that tube and see if you can breathe. That's how he introduced himself. And I waved my arms back and forth. No, no, no. I couldn't speak, of course, because I had this tube in my mouth. And I took a pad of paper and I wrote, I'm scared. Now, I've been around lots of people and dying, but I was scared in that moment, you know. And my friend, the meditation teacher, he, uh, he said, Frank, find your breath. And I went to do that, but I couldn't find my breath, Sam, because the machine was breathing for me. And I couldn't distinguish my breath from the machine's activity. And I shook my head no, and he said, well, then sense your feet. And I tried to sense my feet, but there was this anesthesia haze that was moving through my body, and I really couldn't sense my body so well. You know, in meditation practice, we're always talking about watch the breath, sense the body. But what will you watch when there's no breath, you know? So just in that moment, I thought of another one of my beloved teachers, Suzuki Roshi. And Suzuki Roshi, of course, was the founder of the San Francisco Zen Center. And, and the night before he was dying, he wanted to take a bath. And his wife, Okasan, suggested that he not do that, but his, he insisted. And so his son, Otohiro, he, he picked up his father and he carried him to the bathtub and he lowered the great Suzuki Roshi down into warm bath water. And as he did, Suzuki Roshi became terrified. And his son said to him, Father, calm yourself. You know, I'll breathe with you. <laughs> and, um, and Suzuki Roshi was able to stabilize and calm himself and have his bath. He died the next day. So in this situation in the hospital, I somehow remembered this. I mean, 
I think our teachers come to us in ways to help us, or we remember them in ways that help us. And in this moment, what I did was I grabbed my friend, the meditation teacher, and I pulled him close to me, and I put my ear next to his mouth, and I listened to the rhythm of his breath, and so I could stabilize myself on his breath, because I couldn't find my own, you know. And my son, who I love beyond words, he just kind of slipped his hand in on my chest, you know, and it was like a conduit to God. It was just pure love, actually. And those two things, that unflinching love of my son and the able to borrow, if you will, the stability of somebody else, the stability of his breath, really allowed me to stabilize. And then I could say, I could gesture to say, okay, take out the tube, you know. So I think our, our practice has to be fluid. <laughs> it can't be rigid, you know. It's not going to work the way, you know, we were necessarily taught in the bubble of a meditation retreat. Did you have a background using psychedelics yourself? And I'm wondering what you think about the use of psychedelics in, in a clinical setting to help people prepare for death. Or yeah. there's obviously been some work giving psychedelics to people who actually have a terminal diagnosis. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work going on around this now. Of course, there was you know lots of work earlier on in the late 70s, especially Stan Groff and Joan Halifax were doing great work, but many people were doing it. Um, and yes, of course, I have, a, you know, my experiences of psychedelics from my earlier days. I haven't had direct experience uh, with people taking psychedelics close to their death, although there were people that I counseled who wanted to go through this, and I got them into programs where they were, you know, well supported. And yes, people are finding that, uh, particularly MDMA and uh, some others, are really helpful, in particularly in the months before death, in terms of reducing a kind of existential anxiety. You know, um, The people who have done that, who have reported their experiences to me, seem to have really positive experiences. I have a concern about it, and the concern is that medicine will get a hold of this and will think of you know, people's anxiety as something to pathologize, and will start using psychedelics as the medication rather than a lever, if you will, for opening up their hearts and minds. So I, I, you know, I think that there's some skillfulness in it. I think we're finding out there's great work being done at Duke. NYU has some great programs. There's several places in the country where that's going on now. And I can imagine it could be quite useful. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're doing it anyway, Sam. We, and we give people massive doses of strong medications before they die, often to manage their pain or things like Ativan to manage their anxiety. And these are altering substances. So I think there's a value to it. And, um, and but it needs to be used skillfully. Is it going to be used as a bypass or is it used something that actually helps us turn toward the experience? Yeah, well, that's an interesting distinction because if you can imagine a drug better than what we currently have for something like anxiety, it sounds like you would be slow to recommend the use of that drug. But why? No, I'd wanna, I, I wouldn't be slow to recommend it. I would be... I'd want to make sure that there was, that the intention was not just to mask symptoms, but to help someone. In fact, because what do you, you know, if you, if you give a drug and it manages anxiety and then the drug wears off, the anxiety is still there. So you want to help people deal with that anxiety and find some way of skillfully relating to it so that it's not, doesn't have them in such a, by such a chokehold. So, um, no, I mean, we use morphine by the 55 gallon drum, you know what I mean? I'm being facetious, but, and we use, a variety of anti-anxiety drugs at the hospice, Ativan among them. But um, so I think it's really skillful. I think if people are in gut-wrenching pain or they're in unbelievable anxiety, they can't do the work of opening to their dying process. So I think it can be really skillful to use, you know, various pharmaceuticals to help people in that process. What, what is the state of, of pain control now? I think it's really great. But here's the danger. We can manage, for the most part, I would say, at least 90% of people's pain with various substances. And you know, we've, we've raised pain management to a high art form. Now, the, the, the challenge here is, what's that in the service of? I mean, if our job was just to snow people through their dying, in other words, just to you know, sedate them through their dying, and sometimes that's, in fact, what needs to happen, well, that would be pretty easy. But I don't think that's our job. I think our job is to help people be as awake as they want to be in their dying process and that we manage those medications and titrate them so that people can, in fact, have that 
level of awakeness, let's call it, or alertness, or relational capacity, while still having their symptoms and pain well controlled. Now, there are certain situations where that's not possible. Yeah, I mean, that's really the problem, though, that there's this trade-off between awareness and analgesia. But if we had better analgesics where there were no such trade-off, you know, assuming that's pharmacologically possible, that would really be a breakthrough where you could cancel the pain and be wide awake. I, I agree. I mean, you know, I do think we've gotten much better, but I also think, you know, we're still a little clunky, you know, we're, we're finding our way with it. But, uh, the, and the real problem, of course, is that oftentimes people don't, um, they got on various protocols and sometimes those protocols are continued into their dying process when they don't no longer need that particular protocol or when some parts of it, we could say, could be backed off. You know, People aren't metabolizing the medications as quickly when they're in the final days of their lives. Um, and you know, there's always the question about who are we medicating here? You know, are we medicating the person who's dying and or his or her family or, for that matter, the healthcare practitioner? I, I, we had a woman in the early days of the hospice who was dying and she was a little depressed. And that seemed natural to me. She was dying. And the caregiver, the nurse came out. We had a visiting nurse at that point. Came out and said, I think we should start this antidepressant medication. And I said, okay. I said, but that takes about six weeks to four to six weeks to start taking effect. She said, yeah, three to four weeks. And this woman was clearly days from dying. And I said, well, why do you think we should do that? And she said, well, she's clearly so uncomfortable. And it's so hard to watch her be so uncomfortable. And I said, well, maybe you should take the antidepressant, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, so I think we have to be careful about, you know, who are we medicating here and, and what's the purpose of the medication, you know. I, I'm a great supporter of using the best of what medicine has to offer, but I don't think we should allow it to be the only driver in, in the situation. I think dying is, is uh, much more amount of relationships than medicine. Are you s still at Zen Hospice? No, I, I retired from Zen Hospice in 2005, I think it was and started another organization called the Meta Institute. And that was about taking what folks who were dying taught us and carrying it into the world. In other words, creating some trainings for uh, mostly healthcare professionals, docs and nurses, social workers, chaplains, et cetera. And so we created a little faculty. So do you do conferences or workshops or retreats? Yeah, mostly uh, in-depth um, workshops, five day long programs. Um, me and Ram Dass and Norman Fisher and Rachel Remen, people you know, um, people who, this is kind of our legacy project, you know, it's, it's, we're trying to offer to the world what, you know, folks who are dying taught us. Well, it's really wonderful work and it just seems psychologically speaking, mission critical. And yet it's amazingly esoteric. One wants to clone you and all your friends and scale this up because it's, um, uh, you just get the sense that we're living in a culture and in a time now where, I mean, if ever there was a time that was not well suited to imbibing this wisdom sooner rather than later and not taking life for granted. I mean, we're living in just the age of the smartphone and perpetual distraction. And it's amazing to consider that the advice that people like, you know, Socrates and the Buddha gave on this and really every other issue, just not to be distracted into the automaticity of life and take some time to pay attention to, to the most important things. That advice was given at a time when the only distraction was going to the tea shop. Now we live in this world where, you know, people can't figure out how to play less than six hours of video games a day because the video games are so compelling. Have you thought about how to use the technology of the moment to make this kind of thing more salient and bring it to some sort of scale beyond which you can do physically by being in the room with, you know, a hundred people at a time? Well, one is I think that, you know, um, people are, I think actually death is coming out of the closet. I think people are talking about it a whole lot more. We have death cafes, we have, you know, uh, physician assisted death now we have you know people who are promoting good changes in medicare policy um and there's hard-nosed journalists that are looking at this question new york times has got an ongoing section on this which i think is terrific i just wrote a book called the five invitations which is all about what are the what does dying have to teach us about living fully you know how can we draw on the wisdom of dying to to live a full and happy life you know 
So I think that there are many other kind of tools now that people are using. Um, I mean, I'm going, I just got invited by the Young Presidents Association. These are young, you know, entrepreneurs and you know what they are. I'm going to their international conference in Singapore to talk about this to them. So, and to talk to them about, gee, in your companies, could you start to have this conversation? And we've turned over this conversation to priests and undertakers and doctors, and we've robbed ourselves of the holy significance of dying. And I think of one of the most important conversations in our lives. So I, first of all, I want to applaud you for your willingness to have this conversation and to share it with the people who listen to your, to your program. We just need to, you know, like we're, we're both of the age, Sam, where we came up with uh, rugged individualism. You know, we like to have our coffee in 17 different, different ways. And I think our generation is going to start making demands on both the healthcare system and our own family and friends to meet dying in a new way. So I'm actually very, very optimistic about that, even given all of the things you were saying about all the distractions that are there. The really amazing thing about dying is it cuts through all that. You go into a room where someone's dying, it's hard not to pay attention. Yeah. And so, um, you know, as death gets, comes more and more, if you will, out of the closet, I think, uh, and people start to have these experiences, I think what they start reporting is, my God, that was such a gift to be with my Auntie Jane or my mother or my grandmother or whoever it was. And people are less frightened to be in the room now, I think. And I'm, so I'm, I'm optimistic, really optimistic about what's possible. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I want to invite people into this, you know, like I call the book Five Invitations because, you know, when I, when you offer an invitation, it's a, it's a request to show up, right? For my party or for my wedding or whatever it is. This is an invitation to show up for your life. Let's step in and be present for this life, every bit of it, you know, not miss a moment of it. And that's the only real preparation for dying. And I'm not sure anymore that the most important thing is that, as some traditions offer, is that moment of death. I think it's our whole life that prepares us for that. And uh, so, no, I don't want us to get fixated on a particular moment, but rather let's live our life in a way that's responsible and compassionate and wise and hopefully loving. When you think about how to meet that challenge, is it generally framed by the concept of living without regret? Is regret the right idea here? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's I, I think, I mean, there are books out there about, you know, regrets and they're wonderful books and they do send the message of what people, you know, um, the, the shortcomings around, around their lives, you know, but it's too late then. It's too late. You know, I, I don't want to talk about regret. I want to talk about the transformative possibilities of this life. I want to talk about the joy, <laughs> life fully lived, you know. One of the invitations in my book is welcome everything, push away nothing. Now that sounds good and make a great bumper sticker, but how do we do it? You know, I think it's, I think it's the willingness to actually meet life on its terms, whatever's on your doorstep. What does this have to show me? What can I learn from this experience? It's not about managing all the conditions, but it is about how am I relating to those conditions? Yeah. Well, there, put that way, it's of a piece with mindfulness or any kind of deliberate contemplative practice where you're just, you're looking at the mechanics of your own suffering your own resistance to whatever's arising in the present moment and transcending that simply because that is in fact the only way to connect with some form of well-being in that moment i mean it's all about on that level maximizing your well-being in each moment insofar as you're able yeah i mean i i think we lose something really important in life when it's more important for us to be the one who knows than it is to be the one who's awake to what's happening, you know? I, I think we get really swept away by, by this, by our knowing and our fixation on that. Suzuki Roshi had that great expression, which I've always loved. He said, not always so, not always so. In all those traditions that you and I have studied, you know, whether it's Zen or in some other form of Buddhism, where they talk about not knowing or the don't know mind, you know, this mind that's curious and full of wonder and uh, isn't driven by agenda. This is, this is what, um, I mean, I read that in all my Buddhist books, but folks who were dying taught me that all the time. When I'd ask them, what do you think is going to happen after you die? 
mostly they said, I don't know. I don't know, but I'm curious. I want to find out. You know, Mary Oliver has that line in her poem, what will that cottage of darkness be like? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that the way in which I live my, live my life will enable me to meet that with some degree of wonder, with some awe, maybe some curiosity, instead of just with fear. Well, this is a necessary conversation, and so it's one that I really enjoyed, Frank. No doubt this topic will come back around, and I want your voice in my ear when it does. Please tell people where they can find out more about your work, and if you have any resources you recommend, obviously I'll post a link to your book where I embed this on my blog, but perhaps just tell people where they can make contact with your work online. So the easiest place is fiveinvitations.com, fiveinvitations.com. And on that website, it talks about the book, but there's also lots of materials there that for people who are grieving, for people who are wanting to be more mindful in their caregiving, for people who are you know, working in healthcare. So there's lots of articles and free downloads and all kinds of stuff for people there. So that's a great resource. The second one is Meta Institute. That's M-E-T-T-A institute.org. And that's the training arm, the training organization that we have, which teaches, um, for the most part, healthcare professionals, but also lay caregivers about um, how to mindfully and compassionately care for people in the final um, months of their lives. So um, again, my emphasis is not so much on just caring for the dying, but what can you learn? What do dying folks have to tell us? You know, we have beautiful galleries where people can go and see great paintings. I hope that someday we have beautiful places in which people are dying and we go to them and say, how then shall we live? Show us, help us to understand. You know, what are you seeing here on the precipice of death that we need to know for the rest of our lives? Well, the, the next time you go to Silicon Valley and someone raises his hand and says that he's planning not to die, that's the person I think you should ask for funding for this chain of <laughs> beautiful hospice centers because we need them and you know, it's, it's time for the, the billionaires to start funding them because I think that's a safer bet than curing death. Yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks a lot for doing this. I really appreciate you doing this. And, and I also like the conversation. I like, you know, it was great to have not a soundbite conversation, but an intelligent one that, in which we could have a, a real full back and forth. So thank you for that. Well, to be continued, Frank. Oh, I'd like that. I'd like that a lot. If you're enjoying the Waking Up podcast, there are many ways you can support it at samharris.org forward slash support. As a supporter of the podcast, you'll get early access to tickets to my live events, and you'll get exclusive access to my Ask Me Anything episodes, as well as to the AMA page on my website, where you can pose questions and vote on the questions of others. And please know that your support is greatly appreciated. It's listeners like you that make this show possible.